Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Praise God. First John chapter 5 and verses 14. First John chapter 5 and verses 14. The Bible says, and this is the confidence. Praise God. That we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he heareth us somebody say amen if we ask anything according to his will he heareth us this is the confidence this is the confidence this is the confidence that if you ask anything according to the will of god he hears you the next verse says and if we know that he hear us whatsoever underline it we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Somebody shout hallelujah. He said, if we know that he heareth us. Probably begin from 14. Hmm? And this is the confidence, the assurance, Amplified says, the privilege of boldness. The reason why you're bold in your faith. He says, which we have in him. We are sure, the Bible says, that if we ask anything, make any request, According to his will, in agreement with his own plan, the Bible says he listens to us and hears us. And the next verse says, and if since we positively know, positively, not negatively, positively know that he listens to us in whatever we ask, we also know that with settled and absolute knowledge that we have granted us our present positions, the requests made of him. Yeah? In other words, there's one confidence every man has. That if you ask anything according to the will of God, he hears you. And he says, John, that if you know that he hears you, then you will have the petitions which you ask. If you know that he hears. That means he does not hear and not answer. You understand what I'm saying? And he does not answer except according to his will. So if you ask anything, anything according to his will, whatsoever you ask, if it's in line with the will of the Father, it shall be done. So then our question ultimately is, how do we pray in the will of the Father? Somebody say amen. How do we speak to God in the will of the Father? How do we pray in the will of the Father? How do we know how to pray in the will of the Father? Because he said, if you ask anything according to my will, I'll hear you. And if you know that I hear you, then you will have, you will have the assurance, that confidence, the knowledge, the full knowledge, that whatsoever you have asked for, it is granted whatsoever you ask in his will it is granted whatsoever see sometimes we must see how easy and simple the gospel is because sometimes we complicate it are you hearing me he said if we know that he hear us ask. if we know that he hear us then we, whatsoever we ask, whatsoever we ask, says we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him, if we know that he hears us. But you see, he only hears us if we pray in his will. So then we must know the will of God in prayer. It's like intercession. I have challenges with people who call themselves intercessors because they have made it a calling and an office which is not registered in history, biblical. There is no such calling as intercessor. You understand what I'm saying? Does that mean you shouldn't pray for the ministry? No. There's only people who are more gifted in prayer, who have more grace for prayer than others. But there's no such thing as the office of intercessor. Intercession is supposed to be the responsibility of every Christian. Are you hearing me? It's supposed to be the responsibility 
of every Christian. The Bible says, make, I exhort you therefore, first of all, supplications. Make supplications, intercessions, and giving thanks made for all. He didn't say, for you intercessors. No, intercession, supplication is supposed to be made for all, giving thanks. Made for all. You're supposed to pray for all, but it's your responsibility as a church to pray. You know, some of you don't pray for the ministry. You're too engulfed in your little small needs. You don't pray for your ministers. And some of you do. Thank you for those of you who pray for ministers. Thank you for those of you who pray for the ministry. You are intercessors, but I don't want you to call that a calling. No. I want you to appreciate that every Christian is mandated. You're only doing the right thing and others are not. You see, I have learned this for a fact. If you are struggling in an area, I have learned this by God. If you are struggling in an area, huh? if you find yourself struggling in an area, this is principle spirit. Look for somebody going through the same and pray for them. You don't need to hold their hands or call them, hey, 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 I'm struggling with alcohol, come and I pray for you because I know you're struggling with it. No, no, that's not what you're saying. It is supposed to be sort of a secret place of intercession. You're not even supposed to tell them that you're praying for them. But if you're struggling in any area of life, seek for somebody struggling in the same and carry them in prayer. You're going to be amazed at how God will deal with your issue. Somebody shout hallelujah. You're going to be so amazed at how somebody, a God will respond to your issue. You might not even be having a problem, but then somebody somewhere you admire to be, pray for them you'll see how much you attract of what works in their lives. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's part of our responsibility to pray for people. Okay? So, don't make it a calling. Make it a responsibility. Anyway, back to the point I wanted to make. He said, so what is disturbing the Christian here is what is the will of God? What is his will? Because if I ask according to your will, I know that you'll hear me. And if I know that you hear me, then I'll have the petitions that I ask for. You cannot be an intercessor without the revelation of the will of God, isn't it? How are you interceding when you don't know the mind of God pertaining an individual? Is it, does it work? It does not. You cannot say, I'm praying for sister so and so, when you don't know the revelation of God pertaining to their life. Same it is when we're talking about the will of God. You cannot say that I'm praying in the will of the Father when you don't know the mind of the Father, when you don't know the way of the Spirit. You must know the way of the Spirit. You must know the way of the Spirit. You understand? When the way of the Spirit is revealed to you, then you know how to pray. You understand? You understand the will of God. And here, I'm going to demystify a very mighty mystery in our life of faith and prayer. Now, I want you to listen to this. The way the mind of God works toward the believer is different from the way the mind of God works toward the non-believer. How many of you know that? If a non-believer comes and they're suffering from a disease, and a believer comes, and they're suffering from a disease. To God, one of them is sick, one of them is not. This is the mind of God. I don't you to understand this. It's true that in the flesh they both have infirmity. But to God, one is sick, another one is not. Why? He said, and the inhabitants in Zion, in that land, he says, none shall say, I am sick. He said, I will build up Zion, and it shall appear in what? Suffering? In turmoil? What shall it appear in? Glory, he said. He says, when, when Zion shall appear, when he shall build up Zion, he says, it shall be built in glory. It shall appear in glory. The, the, you and I dwell in Zion. How many of you know that? The Bible says, you're coming to Zion, the city of God, to the... To the Somebody of innumerable angels to the spirits of judgment made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant of the, of the blood, who's the Bible says, who speaketh? Eh? He, the Bible says, he, the sprinkle of the blood that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Abel is vengeance, revenge, anger. 
The blood of Christ does not speak vengeance. It does not seek retribution against an evil act. It does not seek to revile when it's reviled. It doesn't seek to revenge because it's hard. It doesn't seek to fight back because it's fought. That's not the blood of Jesus. And, and, and I want Christians who are vengeful. Some Christians have a silly mentality that is not of our nature. Oh, I will get back at you. I will revenge. They go on radio and revenge against fellow Christians. They go on television and revenge against fellow Christians. They go on social media and revenge against fellow Christians. They revenge. That is not the spirit of Christ. Tell your neighbor, that is not the spirit of Christ. His spirit speaketh better things than that of Abel. It speaks love. It speaks forgiveness. It speaks reconciliation. Let me tell you, God can take you to a place of somebody hurting you so bad that you're sure you'll never forgive them. And he tells you, because it's your nature, let go. Listen, it's very expensive to keep anger. You'll die easily. You'll die quicker. For your, the sake of your health, your wealth, and your soul, don't keep anger in your spirit forgive and let go. Somebody shout hallelujah. But he says, but when he shall build up Zion, he says it shall appear in his glory. Is his glory seeking? Hello? Okay. Let me make it simpler. So he says, in Zion and none of the inhabitants in Zion shall say, I am sick. He said it. He says, and the inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell in shall be forgiven their sin. Are you a believer? Were you forgiven? If you are forgiven, then he says, none of you shall say, I am sick. But you see, Apostle, I'm feeling pain. As yes, you're feeling pain. You probably have been diagnosed with some. It's okay. But he said, you shall not say that I'm sick. It's not supposed to be in the vocabulary of a new creature dwelling in Zion because you've come to Zion, isn't it? Now, because you've come to Zion and there's not supposed to be sickness there, or God does not expect you to even speak about that, when the both of you approach God, the one in the world is truly sick. Why? Because these sins are not forgiven. He still carries the iniquity of the Adamic nature. But you have the righteousness of God imputed on you and he counts not sin but righteousness on you. So he does not expect you to be sick. But yes, the physical reality is that you are sick. When both of you come, the mind of God doesn't look at two sick people, one a Christian and one not. The mind of God sees one sick man and one whole man. In spite of the pain. When a Christian approaches God and a non-believer approaches God and they both have financial issues, the non-believer is a poor man. The believer to God is not poor. That does not take away the fact that both of them don't have money in their pockets and have zero on their accounts. That's true. That's a fact that both of them don't have money. But both of them can't come and say, Father, we ask for a financial breakthrough. When this poor man asks, he understands because he's poor. But you, the Bible says, we know of the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus. We know of the grace. We know. We know of the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus. For though he was rich, yet for your sake, for your sake, he became poor, that you, through his Poverty might be rich. We know of that grace. That is regardless of whether you have money or you don't have money. That's regardless of whether you have your finances are big or they're not. You come to God, you come, you come to him, and he looks at both of you. Yes, the fact is that both of you are lacking. But when this man who's no one again says, I'm poor, he understands because he does not carry the grace that has received Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. We don't blame him for that. Maybe he's on his way there. But my point is, if he says that I'm poor, he's right. Because there is no grace upon him of the master that he made himself poor, though he was rich, that through his poverty we might become rich. But when the same Christian comes to God and tells God that God, I'm poor, I need a financial breakthrough, get me a job, get me a house, God, I'm tired of struggling. How long will I struggle financially? God does not understand you. Because his mind knows you're rich. 
His spirit knows that you're rich. So when you say you're poor, you have actually spoken contrary to truth. You are saying that he is a liar. You're lying. You're saying I'm rich but I'm not. Why? Because I don't see that well. So how can you say I'm rich when I don't see it? Oh no. You don't need to see it for you to know that you are rich. Do you? No, you don't. We walk by faith and not by sight. Somebody shout hallelujah. We walk by faith and not by sight. When he says now that you live in the spirit, walk there also. How do you walk in the spirit? By walking by faith. When you apply faith, you're actually walking in the spirit. It's like the prophetic. It's like the prophetic. How do I know that somebody has something and they come out? How do I know that God is going to touch somebody and they do? How do I call out somebody and I say, you have this in your left breast and it's there? How do I call somebody and I know that you've spent these months with uh, sinuses or you have been afflicted in your right side of, and some of them I call them, identify you individually and say, the Lord has told me you're going through this. But when a man of God starts to walk in faith, enough to pick such details, eh? The opening gate is faith. I must believe that he's going to speak to me about you. You understand? I must believe that he's going to speak to me about you. It is a place where I yield my spirit to him and when I do, he speaks. He speaks. But you see, you can't access except by faith. You must have faith to hear. And once you understand how that faith works, you'll be amazed how much any Christian can hear. You'll be so amazed how much any Christian can hear. When men of God or prophets come, they'll only be confirming what you already know. You understand? They'll just be confirming what you already know. It is possible. Why? Because you have the word of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. You have the word of God. He's a designer of hearts. He separates the born and marrow, exposes our hearts and souls for what they really are. And nothing is hid before him. For all things are defenseless. They are naked before him with whom we have to do. So nothing is hid in the word. If you have the word of God, everything is defenseless. Your thoughts are defenseless. I know what you think, some of you, or many of you. So God speaks, and he can speak to you. Tell him he can speak to you. Yes, it's possible. But you see, we walk there by faith. You must believe that he's going to speak. You must believe that he loves you enough to tell you what concerns your life. Because he is God. He is God. Somebody shout hallelujah. He is God. We are men of the spirit. And what I must know, he tells me. What I must not know, he died. And I don't look for it. I'm, that, that's, how, that's maturity. You know, some of you go looking for words. Apostle, what is the Lord saying? Prophet, tell me. Man of God, you tell me. No, listen. Whatever you need, he will perfect that which concerns you. Which means that he will find a way to speak to you what you need. What you don't need, it's all right. For me, I don't hold him a ransom not to know what I don't need because I don't want to lack to see. I want purpose in, this, in the vision. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody say whatever I must know. God, you'll let me know. Amen. Yes, he will. He will. If God sends a prophet, perfect. Let him confirm. But he will not be the affirmer. You know. You know. You already know. You understand? That's how we judge it. And say, no, you know what? I think here God has spoken to me about this area. You understand what I'm saying? You must be able to hear God for yourself through his word. You must trust your spirit that it is born of God. You must trust your spirit. At least have faith in you. Have faith in what he has put in you. Just have faith in what he has bestowed in your spirit. You'll be fine. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah again. But I'm still trying to make a very important point here. That when the poor man comes and the born again and the non-believer, both of them don't have money, when a poor man says, I need money, God understands because he's not in the covenant. But when, when, when a born again Christian comes to God and says, God, I'm tired of poverty, I'm striving. Somebody one time sent me a message and said, Apostle, I don't know, I've done everything, but my finances have failed to change. Things are failing. I did not respond. Not that I wanted to be rude or that I, didn't want, I did not respect what they asked me. But you see, the mind of God doesn't know how to respond to you that way. 
I looked for words for them in the spirit and I didn't find any. Why? Because how can somebody who Jesus himself became poor for? That's why he got the crown of thorns. Because many of you count the, the blood of the back, right? The wounding for our transgressions and the bruising of our iniquity. But many of you do not see that a crown of thorns was put on his face. And what happened? The stones pierced his brow. And remember the curse in Genesis? He says, for the man shall sweat of his brow to feed his own household. That means that the Christian is not supposed to sweat to feed. That means we don't need to work to be rich. We work because we owe humanity that responsibility. Why am I saying so? Some of you are abusing and are shaming the gospel. You don't want to work. You young men, you don't want to work. Seriously, some of you don't want to work because Jesus paid it all. <laughs> Christianity must be practical. Separate the blessing from the responsibility. Work is the responsibility. The blessing follows the responsibility. I shall bless the works of your hands. You understand what I'm saying? So young people, work. I worked as a banker, still do work. I go to bed very late. I still do personal business, but I still serve God. You have to work. You have to work. Those my things of marrying somebody's daughter when... <laughs> Women shout a bit louder. <laughs> by faith. Walk by faith. Praise the Lord. Walk by faith. There's a reason why walk or walking by faith is practical. It has to be practical. Somebody shout hallelujah. But I'm still making my point. Are you tired? If you are born again, God doesn't see you poor. You don't even go to a workplace to get money. You don't do business to be rich. You understand? You're working, you're doing business to serve humanity purpose. The money will come either way. When you get that mentality, you earn way more than you work for. Because you'll be serving humanity on divine purpose, but your finances will not be related to your work. What your work gives you is never enough if you want to reconcile it with the blessing of God that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow, that causes you to lend nations and not to borrow. When you understand that, your financial life will change greatly. Greatly. Don't go to a job because they are giving you more pay. Go to a job because there is purpose. If purpose is not there, it doesn't matter how much you pay me. I'm not interested. You'll be amazed how my God will supply all your needs. The principles are clear. Give your first fruit and give your tithes. Don't need God's money. Give the poor. Build. Partner with the ministry. You don't need to have a million dollars or 10,000. No. There is a person I know who gives about a thousand shillings a month, but they are faithful. That's exactly what God is looking for. In due time, you will reap if you don't give up. These are principles. You understand what I'm saying? There is no prophetic word that can release you in finances when you float at these things. It's not there. Because God doesn't go against his word. Do you get where I'm coming from? Common sense. He does not go against his word. So, if two people come to God and um, both are poor, but one is born and one isn't, God does not see this man poor. So if this man says, God, I am poor, that man has already changed the course of truth and called God a liar. He's not praying in the will of God. He's not praying in the mind of the Spirit. He's not praying in the revelation of what God has done. That man cannot expect to receive. He's double-minded. He has the mind that Christ has provided, but he also has the mind that he lacks. What does the Bible speak of? Double-minded men. The Bible says they are unstable. They are wavering. 
like a wave of sea driven with the wind tossed to and fro. And the next verse says, Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. He didn't say, Let that man think that he, not think that he shall be given anything of the Lord. So it's not about the Lord giving. It's about the man receiving. God has given that man everything that pertains to life and godliness. God has blessed that man with all spiritual blessings the heavenly place in Christ. He has given everything that that man will ever need. But here we have a contradiction. What is given versus what is received. And he says, let that man not expect to receive anything of the Lord. Not given. God has given. But he cannot receive. That means he doesn't have access to receive what is available to him. Why? Because his mentality is wrong. If your body is not feeling well and you go to the Lord, go this way. Tell him, God, I know of you that knew no sin but became sin that me being dead and two sins shall live unto righteousness. And by your stripes I was healed. First Peter 2.24, he says, by your stripes, he whose own self bear our sins. This is Peter. He says, hey, you, you this is a man. If, if a man is not feeling well in the body, he says, God, you bore my sins in your own body on the tree that I being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by his stripes I were healed were healed Peter says ye were ye were but I'm still sick ye were but I'm still sick God you liar hey is God lying let God be true and every man a liar that's why he says the inhabitants in Zion shan't say I'm sick because ye were healed so you go to God and thank him, oh God, thank you for divine health. Oh, the pain is there. Yeah. Thank you for divine health. That's why he says making supplication and intercessions with thanksgiving. Even when he was talking about the, 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 the other thing of praying for people. Huh? Before that, before the Philippians, the, the previous verse, when he was talking of, of making all prayer and supplications and, and intercession, huh? he says, I exhort you therefore that first of all supplications, listen, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. We don't leave out that. The giving of thanks must be in our prayer. Because we know what God has done. Somebody shout hallelujah. In the Philippians. He says, be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. He says, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Again, he says, with thanksgiving, let your requests known unto God. With thanksgiving, let your requests known unto God. With thanksgiving, thank you God. Make your requests. Not request and thanks. No. With thanksgiving, make your request. I thank you, God, because I'm rich. That's the man struggling with finances. For I know of the grace toward me that though you were rich but made yourself poor, that I, uh, through your poverty, might be made rich. That's what you did. That's what you provided for me. I refuse to look at my bank account. I refuse to look at the text message from the landlord. I refuse to, to listen to what the teachers are saying about the education of my daughter. I refuse to regard what they're saying about my finances. I know that you, God, gave me that grace to become rich because you became poor. You were a rich man, but you substituted your wealth with my poverty and gave me your wealth that you might retain my poverty. Therefore, I claim by God that I'm a rich man. Thank you. That's a man who has prayed. That's a man who has made the right prayer. I thank you because I was healed. You were healed? Because you're still feeling pain. Yes, but I was healed. Let God be true and every man a liar. Whose report will you believe? Will you believe the report of the flesh? Or are you going to believe the report of the spirit? Hello! Are you going to repeat, believe the report of man, the report of the flesh, or the report of the spirit? I believe the report of the word of God because it does not lie. Somebody shout hallelujah. Say amen. Before I finish the issue of the will, you must know the mind of God when you come to him. God, I'm struggling. God doesn't understand it. He looks at you and says, struggling? You're struggling? You're struggling? Paul, he's struggling. Peter, Jesus, come and see. The, the poor br brother. Then you become a laughing spectacle. Elijah slaps Elijah. <laughs> you understand? You look funny in heaven. King of endless world, uh -huh. no one could express 
How much you desire. Then the ugly line comes through. Uh-huh. Though I'm weak and poor. <laughs> As God is enjoying worship, you get to the land and say, Oh no, come on. He gets himself a glass of water. What's wrong with you? All I have is yours. <laughs> then you start crying. I'll give you more. For the song in me is not what you have And you say, oh, you've such much deeper <laughs> Through the way you're looking into my heart. Then you separate yourself. And then you say, I'm coming back. Where were you? <laughs> Where were you? <laughs> Where were you? Where were you? To the heart of you were fallen. Where it's all about you. Before it was about you, Anita. It's all about your job. I'm sorry, Lord. Then you continue singing. Then you melt your affections because the, 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 the rhythm of the song kind of connects with your wonder of song. And then. You think it's the Holy Spirit over you. And, but you're ignorant. You're killing yourself. You know how many people kill themselves in worship? By the time they are done, they are dead. Though I'm weak and poor, though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. That's called false humility. Tell your neighbor, get rid of false humility. Some people quote the apostles. Silver and gold have I not. But that which I have, I give unto you. Mama, your pastor, then your. Woo! Praise God. Your pastor. Silver and gold have I not? Silver and gold have I not? That which I have, I give to you. No, now you have silver and gold. Praise God. Praise what? Praise God. Praise God. Today we have churches with silver and gold, but neither does the lame man walk. Yes, that's called religion. It's called what? Religion. The spirit of religion. Philosophy explaining God. You understand? We are we, we have been blessed, Abu Uganda, with every spiritual blessing. That's why Paul progressed. From, from the knowledge of Peter. <laughs> yes, he progressed. And he says, uh-uh, Brother Peter, I love you, but we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing, every blessed Christ Jesus. We have been blessed. We've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything. Is money part of it? Yes. Gold is part of it and silver. Me, I can't be poor, even if I try. Praise God. Even if I say, let me try, I still just end up you understand what I'm saying? Because I know who I am. But you must have the gold and the anointing. Somebody say amen. Say amen. Why? Because we need to feed orphans, the poor, the widows, the sick, the imprisoned, hospitals. We do that. We do that. I'm wealthy to do good to those who can't. That's my principle. Where it's the widow, the orphan, I am I'm there. I'm always there. I'm always there. I just don't tell you the things I do because this is between me and God. The God who sees me in secret rewards me openly. He knows that. But that's what I live for. That's why I'm rich. I'm not rich just for people say, ah, you have money. No, I'm rich to help those that don't have. To preach the gospel through that. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> Otherwise, the wealth of this world is so deceptive. The wealth of this world is very deceptive. Don't invest in just amassing wealth, eh? invest in serving purpose. Because they only bury you in six feet. It doesn't matter how many properties you have, they will bury you in six feet under. That's your inheritance. <laughs> then you leave it for people, and they also leave it for people, and they also leave it for people, then they also die, and they also give them six feet. That's, that's your inheritance. If you're longer, we can increase. Praise God. <laughs> If you're a baby, we reduce it. But that's it. 
Hallelujah, somebody. So the mind of God must be revealed. You must know present truth. And there is nothing that opens up the portal of the reality of the will of God like knowing that firstly, all these things we have are through Christ. Isn't it? Okay, let me read for you something very interesting. John chapter 16 verses 23. John chapter 16, verse 23. I'll probably read that and then get out of here. One, two, three, let's go. Read that verse. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He'll give it. In that day you shall ask me nothing. This is Jesus telling his disciples. In that day you shall ask me nothing. You shall ask me nothing in that day. Jesus said, this is the day. Salvation is come. The death and resurrection of our Lord is of Jesus Christ has taken place. Jesus does not expect you to ask him of anything. Jesus, help me. In that day you shall ask me nothing. Jesus, help me. In that day you shall ask me nothing. Jesus! Jesus! In that day you shall ask me nothing. Jesus, help my child. In that day you shall ask me nothing. It doesn't mean that I won't do stuff for you, but you shall ask me nothing. You understand what I'm saying? In fact, in a certain verse, there's a place where he says that if you ask anything in my name, I shall do it. But he said anything, in my name, I shall do it. I, in my name. He didn't say, if you ask me of anything, I shall do it. He said, if you ask me of anything, in my name, I shall do it. I, I'm ready to do, but don't ask me. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. In my name. Not me. Don't ask me. Ask anything in my name. I, then, will execute it. Or the Father will execute it, because me, I and the Father are one. It doesn't matter whether the Father executes or I execute, I and the Father are one. Right? Whether the Father or I execute, it's one and the same, but don't ask me. So let's go back to our art in John 16. He says, in that day, you shall ask me nothing. He says, verily, 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 verily. I told him everywhere you find verily, verily. It means this is ancient wisdom. Ancient wisdom. It's one of the most ancient principles of the Spirit. Every time you see in the Scripture, verily, verily, it means this is one of the most ancient and powerful scripture when you see verily verily that means that that principle is immovable as long as the earth remains it doesn't change under any covenant he says verily verily i say unto you whatsoever you shall ask the father in my name he will give it to you and the next verse says hitherto you have asked nothing in my name you're asking me you're not asking anything in my name you're asking me but he says you have asked nothing in my name and as again, he repeats and says, Ask, he says, and you shall receive that your joy may be full again. He didn't say you will be given. Because it's not a giving thing. You have already been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. Again, you, you, with God, it's not about giving. With God, it's about you receiving. Somebody shout hallelujah. So he says, Ask, and you shall receive that your joy may be be full. Somebody said hallelujah. Verse 25 says, And these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly the Father. And the Bible says, At that day you shall ask, again he repeats, In my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. My responsibility is not to pray the Father for you. He's not as a God, help Sister Rosie. No. Help Brother Richard. No. No, 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 no. He has repeated this in that day. I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. That mean that, uh, uh, that I'm there. You see, many people misunderstand the intercession of the Spirit for you. Again, that's why I take you back to the mind of the Spirit. Before I come there and finish, let me first, I, probably I, didn't, I hadn't, but let me, let, me, let me take you somewhere. Let's go back a bit to the mind of God that I was speaking about. When the Bible says that he maketh intercession, how does he pray? Praise God. How does he pray? 
How does he pray? Romans chapter 8 verses 27. Okay, let's begin from 26. He says, likewise the Spirit also helps us our infirmities. Infirmities there means weakness. Weakness can be poverty, health, whichever weakness or any weakness that you're dealing with. Huh? So he says, likewise the Spirit also helps us our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be added. But the next verse says, most important, and I line that, and he, the spirit that searches the hearts, knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, right? Because he maketh, the Bible says, intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Again, you see, God doesn't pray for you according to your will. Jesus does not intercede for you according to your will. I don't, or no Christian is supposed to intercede for you according to your will. Every person or Jesus, even the Holy Spirit, uh, everybody is supposed to make intercession. Here, the Christ is saying, I can only make intercession for you according to the mind of God, to the will of God. You can't say, I'm poor. Then also Jesus comes through, Mukama, is a poor. In the first place, when you say, I'm poor, God turns like this poor, even Jesus turns like, then they look at each other. Then both eyes turn on you. So God starts to talk to Jesus. Didn't you fix this? Jesus says, yeah, God, we did. But Matthew doesn't know. We didn't we fix this. That's why you became poor, my son. That through your poverty, he will exchange for your wealth. Why is he praying like that? I don't know, Father. Let's look for Apostle Grace. The one who knows how to pray. <laughs> Put to me. Did you get what I just said? Do you understand it? Are you getting it? God doesn't know how to answer such prayer. So when the Spirit, when God is, when Jesus is interceding for you, because he knows the mind of the Spirit, he prays according to his will. Jesus didn't pray that God will make you rich. Uh -uh. He prays, God, open his eyes that he might know what I've done. That's the intercession of the Son. Open her spirit to understand the finished work at the cross and what my blood did, what my spirit has done. Help them understand what is the present truth. You see how Paul is praying for the church. That the Lord God of our Lord and Savior may grant you a spirit of wisdom and understanding or revelation in the knowledge of Christ. The eyes of your understanding being flooded with light. You will know what is the hope of your calling. What is the glorious riches of the inheritance of the saints. What is the exceeding greatness of power. There is a walk within you the same power that he used when he raised Christ from the dead. That you will know how much power is for you. That you will know how much exceeding glory is on your side. But super abundantly out, out flowing and immeasurable it's unlimited. That you will know the hope of your calling. That you will know the there is no part there of the demons of your grandmother who bewitched you on Tuesday the things they planted in your cousin's garden you guys have problems somebody goes, oh there's a pastor there's a man of God who saw things in our ground men we see those things our primary ministry used to go to dig out things of, out of people's we used to find things in the ceiling in the grounds but people never used to change because it's not about what they put in the ceiling or underground. Come on! Greater is he which is in you than he that is in the world. Perhaps even the place where your house is, there's skulls. But greater is he which is in you than he that is in the world. Somebody shout hallelujah. If you have understood it, say amen. So be free. Whether they plant or they water, let them do it. Get your sleep and let them see you going so upward. And they're like, but how come we cannot bewitch this woman? And you tell them, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's the testimony of a believer. Somebody shout hallelujah. So he says, in that day, you sh I shall not say that I will pray for the, to the Father for you. But he says, for the Father himself loveth you because you've loved me and have believed that I came out from God. God loves you exactly the way he loves Jesus. When you ask in his name, it is Jesus literally asking. It is not Jesus asking for you. It is not Jesus asking for you. It is Jesus asking. And he heareth the Son. 
and he loves you exactly the way he loves Jesus. You and Christ are one. Somebody shout hallelujah. When you carry that knowledge, it's the will of God that you ask in his name. It's the will of God that you ask in his name. It's the will of God that you know the mind of God before you ask in the name of Jesus. I want you to know those two things. Firstly, know the mind of God, present truth, and what has been done for you. But number two, when you know the mind of God and the present truth of what has been done to you with thanksgiving, making requests, pray in the name. Not to the person, but in the name. Pray in the name. It's very powerful when you start to read when he says that I will show you plainly the Father. Some of you need to see the Father plainly. That's a very powerful teaching. Knowing Father God plainly. You'll understand why he says that is in the bliss of whom we cry, Abba, Father. He's not just our Lord. He says, in the bliss of whom we cry, Abba, Father. In the joy. It's not in pain. We don't go to God crying. No. We go in the happiness, in the bliss. That spirit we've received. He says, for the spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more in bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. He calls it the spirit producing sonship. In the bliss of which we cry, Abba, Father. He didn't say in the, in the, in the pain. He didn't say in the, in the trouble. He didn't say in the, in the desperation. He didn't say in the turmoil. He didn't say in the, in, the, in the frustration. He didn't say in the depression. He didn't say in the stress. He didn't say in the... No, he said in the bliss by whom we cry, Abba, Father. When you know, when you get to know the Father plainly, you realize you cannot go to him weeping. You'll never weep another day. Your joy will be full. Always. Oh, that matter things that are happening in your life but you'll not go to God if you're crying you'll not be crying because of pain or trouble you'll be crying because of joy unspeakable full of glory you know some people see us crying and they think we're crying out of problems listen I go in the bliss I don't I don't sometimes you might see tears on my face don't confuse them for pain sometimes it's the overwhelming love of God you understand it's over the overwhelming language of God. It's not, it's not, but he's in vain. No, 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 it's not in vain. We go in the bliss. We can cry in the bliss. But we don't cry in the pain. We don't cry in the regret. We don't cry in slavery. We don't cry as those which are bound. That is what they were dealing with. They did not know the Father plainly. And the disciples tell them, Oh, so finally, you've spoken to us plainly. The disciple says, Oh, now you speak plainly and speak no proverb. And the next verse says, Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and he does not that any man should ask of thee. That he is speaking plainly, but the Father is not yet known to them plainly. And they are satisfied that because he's speaking plainly to them, therefore they understand what he's telling them. And the next verse, he says, Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and he does not that any man should ask thee, but by this we believe that thou came from God. And the next verse says this, Jesus answered, do you now believe? Because I've spoken plainly, now you think you believe? No. You, you, you don't believe because I've spoken plainly, do you? My point was not to be plain with you. My point was to show you the Father plainly. But they don't get it. They don't get it. Somebody raise your hand. Speak to God. What a friend I found More closer than a brother I have felt your
And the joy to know that everything you're asking is answered. It is answered. You receive. Not your given. You receive. Just receive. Just receive. Just receive. Just receive. Just receive. Just receive. There is the power of God. 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 From glory to glory. And every day, God acts on you. And tonight I see something special. Come on, you The power of God is here. Feel somebody, God. Somebody, God, move them from one level to another level. Let them receive it. Let them receive the anointing. God is buffing a certain level of demonstration on somebody's life tonight. Come on, God. Listen, the demonstration of power comes through such impartation, and I see it happening. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, you're my friend. I feel the power of God. <laughs> Prophet, take it in the mighty name of Jesus. God opens your ears. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. I mean, some of us are hungry for God every day. We don't stop to hunger for more. And it says it's available. We can only receive. Come on, somebody get a hold of it. Thank you, Jesus. Give the Lord a man of praise. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, and you need to receive him as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to come and receive him as your Lord and Savior. You know, sometimes I pray some of you understand the anointing. I just pray some of you understand what the anointing of the Holy Spirit means in a man's life. It's the same anointing that gets fibroids out of men's bodies. The same anointing that gets HIV out of men's blood. The same anointing that changes ministry. It's the same anointing. So say, if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ and you want to receive him as your Lord and Savior, please come. If you're sick, you know. If you're not well in your body, let me say it that way. I speak healing right now in the mighty name. Just receive it. Receive it. Don't, don't even. It's not given. It was already available for you. Just receive it. Say, I receive it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Those of you who want to give your life to Jesus, if you're here and you say, I've never given my life to Christ, but I want to have him as my Lord and Savior, come. Repeat that after me. So Jesus, tonight, 
I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died and rose again for me. Tonight, you are mine and I'm yours. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.